Welcome to a lecture on common laboratory hardware. In this section, we'll be introducing you as the analyst to commonly employed laboratory hardware. We're not talking about analytical instruments over here. We're talk talking about lab hardware, which is a specific and separate category of equipment. We'll be talking about lab water and solvent dispensers, measuring and dispensing devices, glassware and plasticware, the difference between them and why one should be used over the other, heating, dissolution, and separation equipment, and fume hoods. Let's start the lecture with discussing lab water. You may have heard the term DI water. This stands for deionized water that is arguably most frequently used in labs. Why? It is extremely high purity. Now, high purity means that this particular type of water has an extremely low ionic strength. The ions have been leached out, hence it's called deionized. I've shown an example of a low volume DI system on the right hand side, but they can come in many different varieties and flavors and manufacturers. Now, keep in mind that you will often hear the term millQ thrown around. MilliQ water is, it's a trademark of the Millipore company. This is a, for lack of a better word, a type of deionized water. It's just been passed through additional resins and purification systems so that it's really, really clean. But it is basically ultra pure deionized water. A word of caution be careful when methods or your fellow analysts refer to pure water. Depending upon the technique at hand or the methodology of the types of samples at hand, the definition of pure water can vary significantly. For instance, HPLC grade water is pure for HPLC purposes, but may not be suitable for atomic spectroscopy purposes. So again, just be careful. Please avoid non-deionized water and sample preparation systems. You may encounter reverse osmosis or RO water lurking around. Uh, this is usually not lab grade water, unlike deionized water. It's used for rinsing and that's really about it. You may also encounter tap and faucet water. Now this is extremely, for lack of a better word, dirty water. High in salts, uh, organisms, who knows what else. This is rarely used in any top type of uh, lab manufacturing or research process. Now let's talk about solvent dispensers. There are many different types of solvent dispensers, but one of the most common ones you'll see is the plunger style solvent dispenser, where a plunger system uh, has been effectively screwed on a bottle of solvent. This can be automated, manual, and they come in many shapes and forms. These items tend to be moderately accurate, generally dispensing about my mill levels of fluid, although I have seen them dispense smaller levels as well. Pipettes are very common in a lab environment and generally extremely accurate. They tend to vary based on liquid volume, material compatibility, and speed requirements. Now, there are many types of pipettes, but perhaps some of the common ones you may encounter are the micro pipette, shown on the right hand side, the ones which have plungers at the back of them, serological pipettes, volumetric pipettes, and again, you may encounter these in automated or manual varieties. Now, micro pipettes are arguably one of the more common pipettes that are used in the lab environment. They are frequently found in biological or chemical laboratories. Anything from DNA synthesis to ICPMS preparation, these are found everywhere. They are, if calibrated, extremely accurate and precise and generally dispense between one microliter to 10 mils. Micropipettes do require specialized tips. Tips come in a variety of different sizes volumes and grades. And the type of tip that mates with your particular pipette can be quite specific. I should also mention that these pipettes require periodic recalibration or at least verification to ensure that their internal mechanisms are working as expected. You can perform a quick and dirty check using water to assess pipette accuracy. Given that water's density is one gram per mil, 
Generally speaking, you should be able to test your pipette's accuracy by dispensing a known amount of water using the pipette and then physically measuring it. You may also encounter analytical balances. These are again commonly employed in most lab environments and are generally accurate from about 0.1 to 0.01 milligrams, depending upon your analytical balance. They do require a weigh boat or paper or functionality. You wouldn't simply weigh a uh, solvent or material directly onto the balance that would damage the balance. Depending upon the environment, they may also require periodic recalibration or verification. Let's discuss glassware now. Glassware is used for solution preparation, storage, and analysis. The first major type of glassware you will encounter is Class A glassware. This is generally borosilicate and provides good thermal and chemical resistance. But the real strength of this glassware is its exceedingly high accuracy. Class A glassware is arguably the preferred choice of glassware when available. How do you identify Class A glassware? Well, look on the image on the right hand side. Generally, the glassware should have a giant A designated somewhere to indicate that you're working with Class A glassware. Less commonly, you may also encounter what's called lab Class B glassware. This is generally soda lime arm related type of glass, and it's less robust and chemical resistant than class A glassware. Yes, they tend to be more economical, but in terms of accuracy as well, they're not the greatest. So if you can, err on the side of class A glassware whenever practical. You may also encounter test tubes and vials. They come in many shapes and forms, and sometimes they're made of glass or they're made of plastic as well. They're used usually for solution preparation and analysis and generally provide poor accuracy at best. They're really storage vessels more than anything else. You will also encounter different types of bottles, amber bottles, non-amber bottles. Um, they use for solution preparation and storage, but again, they provide poor accuracy. Beakers example of which is shown on the right hand side are typically used for solution preparation but in reality they're a catch-all solution no pun intended for just about everything from cleaning to solution preparation to storage lots of different uses now while they may look shiny and grand they are considered quite inaccurate so i would exercise caution if using this for solution preparation especially when accuracy is important by solution preparation, I mean measurement, of course. They may be found in a variety of different materials from PTFE beakers to plastic beakers and a whole lot of other types of beakers. I do wanna add a word of caution over here. When I see poor accuracy again and again, these items could be off by between five to 10%, which again, if you're just making a cleaning solution, that's not a big deal. However, if you're trying to make a solution for HPLC grade analysis, now suddenly accuracy becomes a big issue and those five to 10 to 20% errors will keep compounding until your solution is completely unusable. Next, you get Erlenmeyer flasks. They're also used for solution preparation. They're essentially, I call them the big brother to a beaker, usually for solutions that need to be refluxed or have a habit of splashing around or need to be swirled. But fancy as they look, they are not the most accurate. Their accuracy should be considered similar to that of a beaker. Graduated cylinders, I really like these. Why? Because they were designed specifically for solution measurement and tend to be extremely accurate. Again, they come in many different shapes and sizes. Well, one shape, honestly, but many different sizes. I've seen them as small as 10 milliliters to as large as one liter. Then you have volumetric flasks, which like graduated cylinders are frightfully accurate. Now, like graduated cylinders, you will see many different types of volumetric flasks out there as well. They're used for solution preparation and storage, whereas graduated cylinders are used most, mostly for measuring and solution preparation. A volumetric flask can come in a variety of sizes. I've seen them as low as about five milliliters to six liters. You will also encounter 
polymer-based measurement and storage devices. These are often incorrectly called plasticware as a catch-all term. But be careful. In reality, polymer-based plasticware, for lack of a better word, can often be made of material that is not plastic, such as PFA or PTFE. It can, of course, also be acquired in plastic formats, such as high-density or low-density polyethylene, HDPE and LDPE, and other different types of plastics. The use of these depends upon your analytical needs. Plasticware is better suited for certain applications, such as metals analysis, less suited for chemical analysis when you're dealing with organic solvents. Then you have pH meters, which are, as the name suggests, used to adjust or monitor solution pH. Depending upon a lab environment, they may also be used to conduct titration studies, or perhaps you'll have an automatic titrator. Now, an electronic pH meter comes with a measurement probe. The meter is just a collection and translation device. You need a probe, as shown on the right-hand side, a little glass piece with a white cap on it, in order for the pH meter to do its thing. Now, probes can differ based on size, material compatibility, and built-in automated temperature monitoring capabilities. Choose the probe that's right for the job. What I do have to caution you is probes should not be stored in air. Once you're done using your probe, please restore it. Usually uh, place it in a vial or a bottle of buffer that has been made to the manufacturer's specifications as shown in the picture on the right hand side. Please again do not let them dry out, it usually fatally damages the probe. You will also encounter stir plates. As the name suggests, a stir plate is there to, well, stir and dissolve things. This aids in dissolution and mixing and requires the use of a magnetic stir bar as shown on the bottom right hand side of the slide. There's an electromagnet inside the stir plate that spins. And as it spins, it, well, spins the bar on top of it. Assuming this bar is placed in a solution, it will create a vortex. Your stir plate may also have heating capabilities. And again, they can come in many shapes and sizes. I've seen stir plates that have been capable of stirring up to 12 items at a time. Here's a visual example of the stir bar and how it operates. You'll also encounter laboratory ovens. We'll, I'll admit the one on the right-hand side is not the prettiest. It is a older oven. Generally, these devices are capable of reaching about 200 degrees Celsius. They can be a lot fancier than the one that's been given to me. Truth be told, however, they're primarily used to heat, dry, or catalyze reactions. You'll see them used to heat or dry samples, to prepare desiccant, to clean out equipment after it's been made, uh, washed with water, or to encourage cell culture or other biological reactions. It's a good device. Every lab should really consider having one. This is not to be confused with a muffle furnace. A muffle furnace is a ceramic furnace, generally speaking, there are exceptions to this rule, that it is capable of achieving temperatures in excess of 800 degrees Celsius. Remember, an oven tops out about 200 degrees. Muffle furnaces top out a lot more commonly used to ash or char samples, basically to completely incinerate samples and incinerate them as best as you can, although they can be used to clean certain equipment as well. For example, in the world of ICP mass spectrometry, organic coated equipment is placed in a muffle furnace to burn off the carbon. These tend to be dirty work areas, so watch out. If you're looking for high purity, this may not be the place to go, or you may wish to enable and adjust your purity or your storage parameters. You may also encounter sample preparation blocks. These are used to heat multiple solutions simultaneously and are used in biological or chemical elemental applications. Examples of uh, use of these blocks would be, for instance, if you're catalyzing a protein reaction or digestion, or you're trying to initiate a metals analysis digestion as well. They're available in multiple different capacities. You can store as little as six tubes in one or as many as a hundred and of many differing sizes. You may also 
encounter a centrifuge in your lab. This is a device that spins down solutions with the aid of the centripetal force. It literally spins samples round and round and round and is used in solution precipitation, sometimes for concentrating samples or for gradient separation amongst other things. These devices are available in a variety of sizes and speeds. You may see tabletop units. You may see micro and high capacity units. You may see units designed for bottles, for vials, for micro centrifuge tubes. They may be ultra tiny, fit in the palm of your hand or be as big as a room. Keep in mind that there are different speeds as well. Most lab centrifuges are fast, but uh, there are much faster centrifuges available. They're called ultra centrifuges, which require a vacuum. Next, you have fume hoods, which are vented enclosures used to protect against noxious fumes. There are different types of fume hoods for different types of applications. You have to be careful about what you're running. There's a chance that in certain cases, a fume hood that's in your lab may not be compatible with a certain acid or base type. They require a constant exhaust flow. Otherwise, well, they're not a fume hood anymore. They may also have a built-in water or gas line. I want to warn you right away, this is not a biosafety cabinet. A fume hood is designed to protect essentially you from the fume hood, from the contents of the fume hood. It's sucking air inside to aid in effectively exhausting your noxious fumes. A biosafety cabinet is the exact opposite. It's trying to protect your samples from you. What does this mean? In a biosafety cabinet, usually used in biological applications, there's a stream of air being thrown out of the hood. It's effectively trying to keep debris, cellular matter, junk floating around in air from getting inside the hood. Well, what happens if you put an acid inside a biosafety cabinet? It's not venting the acid out, it's going to start throwing the acid fumes right back at you. So again, do not confuse fume hoods and biosafety cabinets. In summary, there are many types and grades of, grades of lab hardware. The choice of hardware ultimately depends upon your analysis type, your quantitation limit, and of course, the almighty budget. Please keep in mind that hardware requires maintenance. Sometimes it requires preventative maintenance on a yearly or every six month basis. Sometimes it may require calibration or periodic verification. So when you're setting up your lab, spend some time. Think about what your analysis is. Read other protocols that may exist, other methods that may exist. Odds are that you already have a source of material out there.